Have you ever wondered why Jesus told his disciples to buy swords before his arrest? Have you ever considered the significance of the horde of pigs Jesus cast the demons into? Or have you ever asked why John 20 verse 7 is even in the Bible? Over the past 12 months, I've come across a few theories about well-known passages involving Jesus that I had trouble believing. I was certain they couldn't be true, but after studying the passages in question, my appreciation for God's word grew even more. Because of their niche cultural ties, I'm confident that not a single one of you watching right now will know all five of these deeper meanings. In fact, if you're one of the few geniuses who knew all five beforehand, comment it down below and I'll mention you in my next video. And I always forget to say it, but if you are blessed by this content in any way, please subscribe. It would mean a lot. Since all five stories involve Jesus in some way, I figured we'd start at one of my now favorite passages, his temptation in the wilderness. Before learning of the gravity of this interaction between Jesus and Satan, I found the passage somewhat pointless. I just kind of assumed that there was no good reason for Jesus to even consider Satan's proposal, making the temptation somewhat easy. But I was sorely mistaken. This temptation remarkably mirrors a verse in 1 John 2 16. Watch the parallels as I read this verse. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. I want to hone in on this last temptation mentioned in Matthew's account. The devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. As I said before, this last temptation just sounds foolish to me. In what world would Jesus ever bow down and worship Satan when he knows God the Father? Why would he consider it at all? In fact, why would Satan bother wasting his time on such a useless attempt at the Son of God? Well, I read a few verses to investigate and discovered that I couldn't have been more wrong. This may just have been the hardest temptation a human has ever experienced in our entire history. A number of verses in the Bible tell us that Satan is currently in control of our world. And we do know from Revelation that in the end, Jesus will take his place and rule the world himself. But what Satan was offering Jesus was a shortcut. Jesus could inherit the entire earth without having to go to the cross. This was Satan's last ditch effort to derail God's salvation plan by tempting Jesus with an escape. But praise be to God that he didn't fall to the devil's schemes and instead bought salvation for us all with his blood. Now, our next story takes place in Gardarenes, a Gentile city, apparently full of pigs. What's with the pigs? Why did Jesus permit the demons to go into the pigs knowing they would all be drowned? Although this seems somewhat coincidental, there's actually a very powerful message being sent by this exorcism from Jesus. At the time, countries were governed by Roman legions, not to be confused with the demon-possessed man with the same name. These legions were groups of four to 5,000 soldiers put in charge of asserting Roman authority in a particular area. And the legion in charge of Gardarenes was especially brutal to its people. Legio ex Fratensis, the 10th Roman legion. And guess what their mascot of choice was? A boar. As we know, a herd of 2,000 pigs charged off a cliff to their deaths. 2,000, the same number of Roman soldiers in a battalion, which was also referred to as a legion. What Jesus is basically demonstrating is not only his power to cast out even the strongest of demons, but his power to throw the entire Roman Empire into the sea with a single word. Jesus' final command to the restored man was to tell the other Gentile cities what mercy he was shown by him, as opposed to his usual response to the Jews of secrecy. I'm sure we all remember the challenging passage about money, where Jesus says, it's easier for a camel to enter the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God, which we know is impossible. So is Jesus saying that it's impossible for the rich to make it full stop? Or maybe we've got the passage wrong altogether. See, the eye is actually referring to the gates of the cities in Jesus' time. At each gate, there were two large doors and a smaller door called the eye of the needle, intended for pedestrian passage only. 
If the larger gates were shut, a camel would have to squeeze through the smaller door by shedding its load, bowing its head, and squeezing its way through. A difficult task, but not impossible. This meaning brings so much depth to Jesus' seemingly impossible command. In order for any of us to enter the kingdom of God, we must be willing to leave behind what we're carrying, bow our head in submission to his will. One passage that always puzzled me was Jesus' command to his disciples to buy swords before his arrest. I always wondered why the disciples would need swords, and in a seemingly perfect moment to use them, Jesus condemns Peter for slashing off the ear of the high priest's servant. Even the disciples were confused. As the guards closed in to arrest Jesus, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? So why did Jesus ask them to bring swords if he was just going to stop them from using them? The truth is, when Peter sliced off the ear of Malchus, the servant of the high priest, he was guilty of committing a capital crime for which he would have been executed. When Jesus healed the ear, he removed any evidence of Peter's crime, meaning that even though he still tried to kill the servant, the evidence that would have brought judgment upon him was raised. And what followed was Jesus' own arrest and crucifixion. Calvin and others in history have strongly affirmed that Jesus was referring to spiritual swords in the earlier verses. But a theory can be made that Jesus planned this scenario to leave us with a beautiful example of his atoning work for us on the cross. Okay, let's finally talk about John 20 verse 7. We know that every verse in the Bible is there for a reason. So what's the reason for the verse after Jesus' resurrection reading, And the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Why does it specifically mention the face cloth of all things? Well, in Hebrew tradition, the master of a banquet would always have a face cloth handy while he ate. And when he needed to leave the table, he would leave the face cloth folded to signify to his servants that he had not yet finished and was coming back. Some speculate that by taking the time to fold his face cloth in the tomb, Jesus was sending a very clear message to his disciples. I am coming back. A truth we know is promised throughout all the New Testament scriptures. So how many of you knew all five of those deeper meanings? If you knew all of them, I will be very impressed because it took me about 12 months to find them all. <laughs> Leave a comment down below and also let me know of any crazier, deeper meanings of Bible stories. Maybe even some Old Testament stuff. We could do a part two. God bless. <laughs>